We were all lied to growing up. Slavery was never abolished. It just changed appearances. Welcome back to my Thoughtful Thursdays video channel. We talk about important things both inside and outside the church. Obviously, racism has everything to do with the church, so it's super important to talk about. And let's be honest, the evangelical church in America is white. It's really white. It was designed that way. The system to make white churches actually worked out really well. We'll be talking about that more next week. We as the church have some catching up to do. A lot of it is just being aware of the racism that is right under our noses every day. When we are steeped in whiteness, we often don't even even see it. And that's a large part of what these videos are even about, to raise awareness. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people where they're just like, I just didn't know. Step one is just being aware. That's the first step, just opening our eyes to realize what is happening all around us. Oftentimes what I'm trying to do in these videos is to show you the ugly, to show you the overt, to show you the obvious forms of racism so that you can start to see racism around you. And you can start to then even dial back and see less overt forms of it. Slavery does exist today. I'm not talking about sex trafficking, although that is real. I'm talking about using black and brown people to do forced free labor or insanely underpaid jobs so that white people get rich off of the fruits of that labor. That system still exists today and it is atrocious. I know what you're thinking, but Kyle, I had a class on the Constitution in grade school. I know that slavery was abolished. Lincoln did it. He emancipated all the slaves. We have the 13th Amendment. Done deal. We live in a post-racist society. Obama was president. Not so fast. That certainly is what you were told. That certainly is what was written down in history books. That, however, is not what happened. History itself is unfortunately a little more sordid as it usually is. Remember, the history books that we used when we were younger were written by white people. They were written by white people to teach white people that white people were the heroes of the story. They made everyone feel great growing up. I grew up thinking that Christopher Columbus was a great man. I remember learning that slavery wasn't all that bad. I mean, many slave owners love their slaves. I would hear things like, look, we allow black people to vote. I mean, they got to be three-fifths of a white man. We are kind of amazing. Look at us, we freed the slaves. We created a wonderful system where they were separate but entirely equal for education. That was for their protection. We were amazing people always looking out for the lost and the least. That was how history was told to us and it's eye-opening when you realize the history that you know was wrong. I grew up just like everyone else. I thought I knew American history pretty well. What I found out as an adult was that I knew American history as told through white culture in white institutions. My understanding of slavery being abolished was 100% incorrect. And I have to tell you that when I learned about it about eight years ago, my mind was completely blown. And I'm assuming that if your skin color looks like mine and you speak roughly the same language as I do, and you are a part of an evangelical church, that you probably are about to have your mind blown too. The 13th Amendment does not abolish slavery. Let's read it really quick. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Our country was founded on the back of the institution of slavery. It made lots of people really, really really wealthy and rich, and it continues to do so to this day. It's totally legal, and it is written right in our Constitution. I mean, seriously, do we think that people who were profiting off of slavery were just gonna throw their hands in the air and be like, well, they won those tricky Yankees. I guess we're gonna have to start making money fairly now without oppressing an entire people group. Of course, they weren't going to do that. After slavery was abolished, a new era of oppression started. Slavery never ended, it just shifted. It isn't surprising then, after the fall of organized chattel slavery, that we start to see black people arrested for and locked up for petty crimes. And we need to look no further than the black codes instilled shortly after the end of the Civil War. They were made with the intention of obtaining a steady chain of cheap or free labor. White plantation owners were like, 
wait a minute, we just lost all of our free labor and this cotton and tobacco isn't gonna pick itself. We better figure something out and fast. And they did figure it out. There were vagrancy laws, for instance, that made it illegal for a black person to be unemployed or without a resident. You don't have a job, bam, that's right. You are arrested, you must now work on this chain gang. What's that? You don't have a place to stay for the night because you're, what's that, you're poor? Bam, arrested, forced to work. And it wasn't just about poverty, it was about race. They were 100% targeting black people to get cheap or free labor out of them. Different states made different deals with penal institutions. They put these prisoners to work through convict leasing programs so that white plantation owners and business owners could lease out people. Those states made serious money. Those businesses made some serious money too. Gee, I wonder who didn't make money out of the entire thing. Poor freed slaves who couldn't get out of poverty found themselves right back where they left off, in slavery, working against their will on plantations in the South decades after the Civil War. But slavery was over. We white people emancipated the slaves. We were the heroes. Not quite. We just decided to omit those chapters out of our textbooks. We didn't even really change the name. The name slave stuck as well. The Virginian Supreme Court ruled that a convicted person was a slave of the state. Not only was slavery legal, it was now state sanctioned and condoned. This was widespread. Black people were being arrested for stupid things that white people did all the time. You think that there weren't poor white people? You think that there weren't homeless white people? The difference was they weren't arresting the white people on a large scale and forcing them to work against their will at a higher percentage rate than anyone else in the country. And the conditions were so harsh. They were so horrible. People worked all day from dawn until dusk. And then in the evening, they were whipped. Many prisoners died under such horrible conditions. In fact, in July of 2018, a mass grave was found of 95 black prisoners who died working in Sugarland, Texas. They died in the 20th century. This isn't ancient news. This is considerably after the Civil War. This is after we emancipated the slaves. We should all be appalled. It was a gruesome time and we conveniently left that part out of our history books. Not only should we be appalled that it happened, but we should be appalled that we don't talk about it. Friends, this practice still exists to this very day. Black people are way more likely by percentage of the population to be stopped by a police officer, to be arrested by a police officer, and then to be convicted. And across the board, when a black person does the same crime as a crime that a white person committed, the black person gets a harsher sentence. This is real, people. I can hear white people across the country already screaming, but if you just obeyed the laws, you wouldn't be arrested. That's not true. Even when black people are following the laws, they are still more likely to be stopped by the law. And then once they're in prison, we strip them of all their rights. They can't vote. We take their humanity away. These people are now disproportionately slaves of the state, yet they don't even get to vote on state laws that would affect how they are treated or the facilities they are held in. It's a horrible practice. I said that people make a ton of money over this practice. I don't know how to draw a harder line between the practice of slavery and the practice of for-profit prisons today. They make a lot of money a shit ton of money, way more money than we should be comfortable with. The private prison industry grosses billions of dollars per year using roughly 900,000 prisoners as its modern day slaves while paying them a few pennies on the hour in some states and nothing in others. It's making the super rich white a lot richer and it's devastating black and brown families. Not surprising, tens of millions of dollars are spent by lobbyists to protect this industry every single year. Now here's the hilarious part. Just as old time slavery was done in the rural areas on plantations to create an economic growth, this modern day for-profit prison system oftentimes is promoted in predominantly rural areas as a rural growth industry, where small town USA hopes to get a piece of the pie. Yes, that's right. Even you can have this amazing potential to put good money right in your pocket by putting this for-profit prison in your backyard. It is so good for the economy, you'd be a fool not to go along with it. Friends, 
We are the worst sometimes. We always want to be the hero of the story, but what happens when we are actually the villains of the story? Not because we personally built a for-profit prison, not because we actually sent black and brown people to jail, but rather because we vote for the same people that are now getting rich off of such an industry. We keep voting against prison reform that would help to end this evil practice. We keep putting our fingers in our ears and shouting, no, 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 I don't want to hear anything about it. Racism's done. We can do better. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Please join me back next week as we take a look at the great race divide that we find right inside the church. Now, I was a pastor for almost 15 years in the white evangelical church, and I think I have a pretty good pulse on what is going on. You won't want to miss it. Make sure you subscribe below if you'd like to keep seeing videos like this in the future. We'll see you back next week, same time, same place.